It's, it's making me download a, a package. <laughs> there we go. I like that one moment where you you're you were blurred. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to find you. Everybody Welcome likes to everyone. Mind. Welcome to those of those of us just joining us. We'll uh um get started in just a second. Um Oh, it's 1202. We'll get started right now. How's that sound? Um, good afternoon. As of two minutes, everybody. I'm Dana Kuhnlein. I work with Reimagine Appalachia. And I'm really excited to be joined here today with um, uh, co-hosted by our friends from the Ohio River Valley Initiative, also known as ORVI, and to talk about this exciting new report that um, they're releasing today. Um, so there has been a lot of um, exciting um, news and funding and initiatives that have been coming into the region. And so um, this is another one that we think is going to be really impactful for the region. And this new report is giving us really important information to figure out how we want what we want to do with that. How can we plan and plan around that? How can we be strategic? Um, as we approach these new opportunities. So I'm really excited um, to learn um, with you all today uh, from our awesome panelists. So a little a little background before I hand it over to them. Um, so one, if you would like to enable closed captioning, that is um, available. Um, two, just sort of a little background, um, we will send out a recording and links that were shared in the chat to um, folks who are joining us. So just let us know. Um, we will have time for questions at the end, so please hold those or drop those in the chat as we're going along. And if you have, um, um, I'm sorry, and we'll and we'll share information that um, or for questions that are asked in the chat that we don't have time to answer in the call, we can usually do those in the follow up email. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, so if you haven't heard, $1.3 billion, with a B, dollars of federal funding are going to be coming in from the, um, um, to work on methane emissions reduction program that has the charismatic acronym of MERP. Um, and that money is going to be coming into our region and can finance jobs to do things like decommission orphan wells and remediate well sites. Uh, methane leaks from oil and gas wells are a significant share of climate-related um, methane emissions in our region. We have, um, as Ted will talk more about during his presentation, over 800,000 wells in the region. And so decommissioning those, making sure they're not an ongoing source of pollution, is a project that's going to create a lot of jobs. Uh, just how many jobs, you're about to find out um, in the information about this report. Um, and so knowing how many jobs that we're going to get to the region is going to help us prepare to get folks ready for these um, jobs to make sure that they're good family sustaining jobs, um, that they're that they're safe jobs and that we're, we're ready to scale up this industry to meet this new funding opportunity and to clean up our environment while um, employing folks to do good work. So I think I will stop. Uh, summarizing the report and maybe hand it over to Ted for a quick intro on 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 the report and hear more about um, more about your findings. Hey, thanks, Dana, so much. Yeah, so the report uh, this was something initiated uh, several years ago, um, not years ago, several months ago. Sorry. And uh, yeah, what I'd like to do is actually, if uh, Greg would go first, Greg is one of the co Greg Compton with the Ray Marshall Center at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, and he is going to present on the job creation from the uh, new EPA rule uh, to mitigate methane at oil and gas uh, infrastructure. So we'll have Greg go first and I'll sort of wrap up talking about the decommissioning well part. And that's part of the MERP program that you mentioned, Dana, and also part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So I'll hand it over to Greg and then we'll come back to me for the uh, decommissioning part. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ted. And thank you, Dana, for, for this opportunity to share this work uh, and to engage in this work. Uh, you know, one of the chief focuses of my research is on how regulations uh, engender the need for additional human resources uh, across companies, uh, essentially jobs. Uh, and so this, this work aligns uh, with that. 
Uh, and the advantage that we have here is that there is federal funding it's meant to sort of offset maybe some of those additional costs that companies might need to bear in order to do it. Uh, considering, uh, as we well know, the harmful effects of methane uh, in the environment, uh, it's going to be very beneficial if we can address uh, these, these concerns. So um, uh, the here I'm going to be focusing primarily on what those new EPA rules are. Uh, and I'm going to give a broad overview, both of sort of where the, those rules are impacting in, in the various chain uh, of uh, oil and gas uh, production uh, side, uh, and then the methodology, and then summarize with the number of jobs. So uh, if you go to the next slide. So uh, the EPA methane emissions regulations, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to examine uh, these yet. Uh, they're incredibly thorough. They cover uh, a broad swath uh, of production uh, and processing uh, and distribution uh, for, uh, for anywhere where there may, may be uh, methane leaks. Uh, so this involves uh, leak detection and repair, uh, specifically pneumatic controllers, uh, as well as compressor stations, uh, both reciprocating the dry seal and centrifugal wet seal compressors, um, as well as storage tanks. All of these facilities, and there are many hundreds of thousands of them across the United States, will need additional monitoring, replacement, uh, abatement, uh, and maintenance activities uh, to ensure that methane um, leaks are, are reduced. Uh, to meet compliance, uh, there are really two aspects to this, uh, both the monitoring and maintenance, as well as the replacement and abatement uh, for monitoring and maintenance. Uh, there, the EPA rules require quarterly uh, audio, audible, visual, and olfactory monitoring of wells and, uh, and other sites um, uh, monthly, uh, and for, for rather those quarterly, and then monthly uh, monitoring for compressor stations uh, for, for leaks. Uh, part of the reason for the difference between these two is we have evidence that uh, compressor stations are more likely to have leaks and need to be repaired uh, more frequently uh, than the monitoring of wells, which is at the quarterly basis. Uh, the repairs follow based on whatever needs are there. Uh, typically, to be honest, uh, there are often the need for some kind of repairs or abatement um, or maintenance once they uh, arrive to those sites uh, because leaks are fairly common uh, with current technology. Uh, a note that that aud audible visual olfactory also is very uh, person intensive and worker intensive. It requires a worker uh, to go through all of the uh, all of the piping, all of the connections uh, to put you know soap on some of those connections to see uh, if there are bubbles that come out. Uh, there are other means and methods that we can use to identify uh, any leaks that may occur uh, at sites uh, across the country. Uh, but those efforts are not, uh, those higher level technology uh, opportunities are not placed within uh, the current EPA rules. So they're, they're still thinking of this sort of in the old fashioned way. Uh, in some sense, this means that there's just more opportunity for jobs. So it's not somebody just working remotely, uh, looking at multiple well sites, but you have to go out to every well uh, in order to, to engage in this work, right? Uh, the monitoring maintenance will also include compressor maintenance uh, and storage tank maintenance. Uh, and then replacement and abatement uh, will include replacing pneumatic controllers. These are notorious uh, leakers of, of methane, uh, and we now have the technology to replace those across the country. Um, and then compressor replacement and abatement and storage tank uh, replacement and abatement. Uh, now, though this applies across the entire country, I've done a couple of, this is my second report uh, looking at, at these numbers. The first was for uh, Texas, for the Texas Climate Jobs uh, Project. Uh, here, I was, I'm looking at the Appalachia region, um, and we have uh, the number of sites by type and state. Uh, note that the active wells, we have about 191,000, and that's the focus of this work, whereas Ted's work is going to be focused on, uh, the, you know, those wells that uh, that are um, supposed that need to be sealed and, and completely uh, uh, cut out from production. Uh, these are the ones that focus on active wells, uh, and there are several uh, opportunities here with pneumatic controllers, compressor stations, uh, the processing compressors, and storage tanks. This gives you a sense of the the wider numbers that we're looking at uh, for the region. All of these uh, will require maintenance, um, and will have the the need uh, for for further. Um, for further workers and opportunities here. So next slide. So for for this one thing, just as a to to talk about the the method and going to sort of the second section here, uh, what I really like to look at here is 
the the estimates that really consider the number of direct workers that are needed to do this work, right? Uh, the the reason I do that is that uh, as a person who engages in labor economics, there are other methods that we can use. Sort of think like these are going to be add on jobs. There are administrative jobs that are going to be needed to do this. There's somebody who's going to have to schedule uh, these visits, and we should account for those folks. Uh, but by looking at the actual direct employment jobs, it gives us really a clear picture of what work needs to be done and who is going to be doing that work, right? Uh, the method uh, on, on the first part here, uh, it really leverages what the most available information is uh, for, for, for me as a researcher. So ideally what I really wanna know uh, are the number of hours of work to complete the tasks, right? Uh, then I use those hours uh, to derive the number of workers that are needed to perform that work. Uh, and then Sometimes we don't have the number of hours that we need to, <laughs> that we need to do that uh, for, for to complete the tasks. And in those cases, particularly here, uh, replacing pneumatic controllers, replacing compressors, uh, adding flare systems to storage tanks, uh, and then also some of the decommissioning uh, the orphaned well sites. Uh, the known and side we, here we use really those costs of installation and maintenance, uh, and then we divide by the hourly cost of work, uh, leading to sort of the calculation of the number of hours, uh, the worker hours that are needed and thus the estimated number of workers, right? Uh, so we use these two methods, uh, basically because where we have the most information, that's where we're, we're, we're leveraging that to get the most accurate picture that we can, right? Um, and so, uh, the, so this is the method that's there. Uh, the As you can imagine, there with all of these different regulations and sort of the different monitoring re responses, et cetera, this can all be somewhat complex. So I encourage you to read through the, the report in full uh, to provide detailed information on how we go about going through this process uh, and the sources and data we use to, to identify uh, how long it will take and the costs uh, and therefore the number of workers that are there. So all of that is detailed, uh, I think, pretty adequately in the report. Um, note that this estimate, the estimates I provide, I include a high and a low estimate. Uh, and I do this because there are some minimum needs uh, related to EPA regulations. In other words, this is just what you're absolutely required to do uh, through through EPA. Uh, but there are other opportunities uh, uh, to sort of fully address uh, methane emissions. In this case, uh, one of those items would be storage tanks. Really, the EPA rules only target like a small subset of all of the storage tanks for which there should be uh, needed an additional monitoring. Uh, and so because of that, I, I think that we should consider, well, what if you were to address all of those storage tank issues? And so that's where the low and the high figure come from. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, I talk about sort of the number of workers that are needed uh, to meet these EPA regulations. Uh, and I break these down into two types, uh, the monitoring and maintenance. Uh, these are the ones that are going to be ongoing jobs that are going to be needed consistently year after year. Uh, and then the replacement and abatement. Um, and these I consider to be, in some sense, temporary jobs. These are jobs where uh, once the work is is done uh, in in construction, they'll simply incorporate these new processes into a new construction, right? Uh, and so they won't need to necessarily have to go back and continue to replace these. Uh, and so we can see that I provide an estimate here for the monitoring and maintenance of about 5,800 ongoing jobs uh, and for replacement and abatement about uh, 9,700 temporary jobs. Uh, and you can see that these vary depending on the type of work that we're engaging in. Uh, so leak and inspe inspection and detection um, is, is uh, roughly the same for the low and the high. Uh, leak repair provides a lot of those ongoing jobs. Uh, the repairs take a lot of time uh, and there are consistently needs for repairs uh, for mm -hmm. folks uh, as, they, as they come to monitor these sites. Um, and then for replacement and abatement, uh, the there are pneumatic the pneumatic controller replacement that's really the primary driver here of these jobs uh the that is just one of the notorious leakers and all of those will need to be replaced at every uh at every uh well uh and then compressors and then the storage tanks right um if we go to the next slide uh, I talk sort of about this so I provide some estimates here a low and a high uh for for all of the states involved in the study uh and then uh and then the total here uh I would say, uh, and this is just the total number of jobs, so that's regardless of, of whether they're continuous or, or not. Um, you know, some of the conclusions here uh, that to, to make a note of is the, the importance of these reports in many ways is to get a sense of we're really at the beginning of this, right? Some of this money has not filtered down. Um, and so, and the, and the rule really just came out in December. And so it really provides an opportunity for communities to plan ahead uh, and to think, well, <clears throat> what are the, what are the, what are the knowledge and skills that are required? Uh, what are the processes that 
are required uh, within the state um, or federally uh, to provide appropriate training and certifications. Uh, this is a, an area and field where there isn't a whole broad swath of established uh, rules around those, those items. Uh, and so it's something that we really need to consider as we're moving forward. Um, uh, a lot of the this work, the skill sets involved in this will be transferable to future installation and maintenance of new equipment. So one of the good things here is, is if you're if you're training new individuals entering this field to do this work, uh, those skills are transferable and they can then continue to uh, engage in, in that work. Um, and the job numbers here reflect only those direct workers. So there's going to be additional wor workers here uh, that are needed uh, with a multiplier. Uh, but in this case, I'm, I'm not estimating them because I just really want to focus um, on, on that work. Right. Uh, the one of the key reasons that we want to engage in this planning is we want to make sure that these jobs are high quality. Uh, we want to make sure that people are uh, receiving uh, good pay. Uh, we want to ensure that there is uh, standards that are being met, uh, and that these uh, the individuals that are entering in these fields are entering careers that are long term um, that can provide benefit for them and their families and for the region in the long term. Uh, next slide. And that, that's the end of my presentation. So uh, I, I appreciate your time. I think just for the sake of time, we might want to go uh, to Ted's presentation uh, and then uh, follow up with questions uh, later. That sounds great. We'll hand it over to you, Todd. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. Thanks, Dana. And like I said, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, great. Greg gave us a tour of the number of workers needed to meet uh, EPA's new rule to reduce methane on oil and gas infrastructure. What I would like to do is explore the number of workers needed to decommission unplugged wells in Appalachia. And this includes orphaned wells and also marginal conventional wells. Uh, so just for background, uh, when an oil and gas well reaches the end of their, when they reach the end of their useful life, uh, state law requires that operators, well owners uh, plug and abandon or P&A their wells. We use the word decommission just to sort of encompass all of that. Uh, and the primary purpose of well plugging is to stop the vertical flow and migration of fluids and gases within the well bore to prevent any dangerous pollutants from going into the air, water, and soil. So decommissioning an oil and gas well includes plugging the well, restoring and reclaiming the well site and remediating the contaminated areas that are there. Uh, next slide, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, and you know, one of the main focuses of this report obviously is methane mitigation. So as we may be aware, uh, abandoned, orphaned, and low-producing wells, oil and gas wells are a significant source of methane emissions. More than 90 coal-fired power plants worth of greenhouse gas emissions each year, according to analysis uh, from EDF, looking at the total metric tons. Uh, these were study the first one at the top looks at uh, the greenhouse gas inventory from the EPA. And the other one is a study that was in Nature of Communications from uh, folks at EDF, Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, and that gives you an idea of the magnitude of that universe we're looking at. And similar to Greg, we're looking at these four states in Appalachia. We're looking at Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And we're also looking at, uh, you know, basically uh, two main programs. Uh, one of them was in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And it, the title of that program is Methane Reduction Infrastructure. And there's $4.7 billion to clean up or decommission orphan gas wells uh, throughout the United States. And about 4.3 billion of that goes to states uh, in the form of uh, three separate grants. Um, and then there's also the Methane Emissions Reduction Program that was included in the Inflation Reduction Act. So about 750 million of that uh, uh, goes to, uh, partly goes to decommissioning low producing marginal conventional wells. So uh, 350 of that, 350 million of that has already gone uh, to I think 14 states, including all four of the states listed in this report. Uh, so I think a total of 700 million in grants will go to the states and the 50 million is uh, for the program itself. Uh, but we just took an estimate of how much money, you know, based on the uh, previous allotment of about 115 million, how much these states might get in the future. There's also another pot of money, the total in the MERP, I think is $1.5 billion. So there's more money involved too. 
uh, that can be used for methane mitigation. So we're trying to conservatively look at exactly how much money could go into uh, plugging wells. And as Dana talked about earlier, the total is about 1.3 billion. So that's 1.1 billion in the IIJA, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, and also MERP about 230 million. So that's that's where you get the uh, total of that. Um, you know, and the what's the money for the methane emissions program goes to low producing marginal conventional wells. Uh, and for folks that don't know, these are wells that are producing less than 15 barrels of oil equivalent a day. Uh, uh, so those are considered low producing marginal. Sometimes they're called stripper wells. Uh, and let's take a look at the next slide, if you can, Ben. Great. So the next slide looks at the big picture. It includes how many workers would be needed to decommission all of the unplugged wells in Appalachia. We're going to drill down a little bit here, but I just want to get people to understand the really big picture. As Greg discussed, it's very important to keep in mind that we are looking at the workers needed on the job site. Those workers, generally speaking, working at an hourly rate. Uh, and this doesn't include management, subcontractors, administration, et cetera. We did this so it'd be easier to plan, whether it's trade unions or workforce development agencies, the purpose is to allow people to plan for this development over time. Uh, so we ensure that we have a well-trained workforce that can do this work. So these are what I would call like direct, direct <laughs> jobs. So we estimate that there are over 155,000 job years in the four states to decommission an estimated 115,000 unplugged wells. I can get, answer questions how we got to all these wells. We basically use the midpoint for the projected undocumented wells in the states, and we have uh, uh, data on the documented orphan wells that states uh, uh, gave to the Department of Interior. And you know, through a database that we subscribed to, we're able to look at the abandoned wells and the active wells too. So theoretically, all of these will have to be plugged more or less over the next 50 years. So there's a lot of work to do in order to do that. Uh, so one of the way we, one of the ways, the way we estimated uh, the 155,000 uh, jobs uh, was by analyzing two recent contracts in Pennsylvania uh, to plug 38 wells. And these contracts showed that about one well is plugged for 0 0.13 job years, or it's about about $530,000 per well. Uh, I can happy to get in detail of other analysis. Generally speaking, uh, in terms of direct jobs, usually 0 0.22 or 0 0.24 jobs are created for every well plug. And each well is completely different and these numbers can move around. But generally what we wanted to do is the same as Greg is look at how many hours it takes to plug a well. You know, each well is different, different geology, different reservoirs, you know, there's, uh, there's the Clinton, there's the Devonian, there's the uh, Utica, there's the Marcellus. So it's, it can get very difficult, especially when you're looking at uh, the high volume uh, hydraulic fracking wells, uh, which generally speaking can cost twice as much. And sometimes they're cheaper, sometimes they're uh, less expensive. It just really uh, depends on the well. Uh, so we can just look at averages in order to get a good sense. But this gives you a sense across the states about the number of jobs that could be created, you know, directly, directly on the well site uh, moving forward over the next 50 years. So we're just at the very beginning of sort of this revolution and beginning to plug thousands and thousands of wells in each state instead of uh, 10 to 100. Okay, next slide, Ben. Okay, so this slide looks at uh, the number of workers needed to decommission wells with the 1.3 billion in funds from the IIJA and the IRA. We estimate that about 15,600 wells will be plugged, including 13,600 orphaned wells, uh, creating over 2,400 direct on-site jobs in the region over the next eight plus years. Uh, so in terms of the orphan wells, that's about 21% of the documented orphan wells would be decommissioned with federal funds. Uh, it's important to remember too, this doesn't include state funding or any, in, or any incoming new orphan wells that are found that are added to the list. Uh, some states spend money. Uh, I can give you an idea of uh, you know, Pennsylvania, for instance, typically would spend around a million or so. Uh, plugging wells before the federal program, uh, while, while Ohio has, had a, has the second biggest orphan well program in the country, 
typically spending around 10 to 12 and a half million a year with state funds. So we're not looking at the state funds or the state program. We're just sort of doing a comparison, looking at the federal program. Next slide, Ben. Okay, so this one is looking at, uh, just to give you an idea of the job creation, because I think, you know, one thing Greg and I could have done in this report is really upplay the amount, <laughs> amount of jobs that are being created and give us a big number that uh, people might not believe. <laughs> but what we try to do is look at the actual hours that were put into play. So uh, one thing I can do just as comparison is you can look at uh, the Department of uh, Interior recently did an analysis of the $560 million in state initial grants that were given to states to plug orphan wells. And their analysis showed that uh, for every $82,670 that one job was created. And this included direct, indirect, and induced. Uh, so if we just look at the IIJ money, you know, we were projecting that we'll need about 2,090 on-site workers uh, you know, in order uh, to plug those wells that we talked about. Uh, where if I use the IIJ number, you know, we're talking more about, uh, we would be saying something around 13,000, almost 13,500. Just to give you an idea, we're not trying to, you know, really analyze all the jobs that are going to be created. We're trying to really help people plan so they can do workforce training and set up a pipeline of workers in order to do this work. So I think that just helps put that into context. Because if we were using the interior job estimates for all the unplugged wells in Appalachia that will need to be plugged over the next 15 years, you're probably getting the neighborhood of about a million jobs, 900,000. So we, you know, we're not projecting that. We know all these wells are supposed to legally be plugged uh, and abandoned or decommissioned. Uh, but we'll just give you some avenues of what our analysis is doing and what it's not doing. Thanks. Uh, ben, next slide. Okay, so one of the big questions is what can we do about it? Uh, how can we create a good pipeline of well-trained workers with good family supporting jobs in order to do this? Now, there are things included in the IIJ Orphan Well Grants Program and the MERP grants that require contractors to pay prevailing wage or uh, Davis-Bacon Davis -Bacon wages, as we call them, while the EPA, EPA meth methane, methane rules do not. Uh, so that's that's a big challenge. And as Greg showed in the report, you know, we estimate, I think, about eight billion dollars of work just implementing the methane rule in this four state region. Uh, so what are those jobs going to look like? Are they going to be good paying jobs or is there going to be sort of fly by the night industry work happening? Or are we going to make sure that we have a high pay the high road to good paying jobs? Um, and recently, there's been some good, you know, examples of states doing things. Once in Pennsylvania, uh, they have they established the Commonwealth Workforce Transformation Program. I don't believe the guidance is out on it yet, uh, but it provides about forty thousand dollars per new employee hired on one of the uh, uh, so for plugging wells. Be a good example of that, uh, and up to four. I think it's four hundred thousand uh, dollars per project for on-the-job training uh, and reimbursements uh, for contractors and other folks. So that's a good step right in the right direction, uh, making it much easier uh, and incentivizing things like apprenticeship programs. Uh, one other example is in California, the California High Road Training Partnership. Uh, they, uh, they uh, you know, the state of California is including these, a large grant to create a certified abandoned well decommissioning or a training program within union apprenticeship programs. Uh, we feel like that's a really great example and they had a total of 14.3 million. And I think it's really important uh, to emphasize when it comes to well decommissioning, there's a lot of good contractors out there doing great work, but there's not a pipeline of workers. As far as I understand, there's not a certified well decommissioning program in, in Appalachia. This one's getting off the ground in California. Uh, but as far as I know, there's not. And that's going to be a serious problem when we see this run up in funding that's available to start plugging more wells and having a professional workforce, and getting people into those jobs that are often in economically stressed areas, you know, should be one of the things that we want to do. So if you're a state agency, like what can you do about that? Uh, you definitely could do what California does and what Pennsylvania is, is, is doing, but also better state procurement. Uh, some states have apprenticeship utilization requirements where 
when they're sending a bid out to contract uh, at the state level, they ensure that a certain percentage of that workforce had to have gone through some type of certified uh, apprenticeship uh, gap a curriculum uh, to do the work that they're doing. You can also do project labor agreements. You can include responsible bidder policy. Uh, you can ensure that workers have health and pension benefits, that the contractors have cert, uh, certificates, certificates of insurance, that they don't have any unresolved violations, and that they require safety training and certifications. A lot of the problem with a lot of the procurement is they don't contain a lot of these things. So if we want to create that high, high road uh, to making these really good paying jobs, and as we noticed, you know, this is we're talking about 50 years of work beyond these two, beyond the uh, infrastructure bill and the IRA. You know, so over the long run, we need to be planning for that. Uh, so th these are ways that we can do that. You know, when it comes to the uh, EPA rule, you know, one thing states could do is sort of offer a, a state uh, tax credit if you pay prevailing wage on methane reduction projects, which, which can help incentivize uh, apprenticeship programs and unions into the work. Or utilize that, or you can, you know, offer a tax credit if they're utilizing an active apprenticeship or training program. Uh, so there are things, there are levers that state and federal policymakers can do to ensure that these jobs are better paying that we have a workforce that can do this uh, for decades to come. Uh, thanks very much. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thanks. We have some great questions in the chat. Um, and a lot of them you all touched on in your presentation, but I think it's definitely worth um, putting a finer point on, um, on some of them just to make sure that it's completely clear. Um, I I want to acknowledge um, Stephen's um, questions in the Q and A function, um, which um, are you know um, from the state regulator perspective, are the federal funds available to staff government workers to scale up the workload to implement these programs? Um, what kind of um, considerations are being made for that? You know, do we have a sense of how many hours or job hours will actually be needed on the regulatory side um, for the folks who are implementing all these um, dollars and great work that you all outlined? I can just speak briefly to the Federal Orphan Well Program. And, uh, agencies are allowed to use 10% of the total grant funds for administration. And that could include exactly what he's talking about. And I believe there's, for the grants, for the MERP, uh, there are similar considerations for administrative programs. So a lot of hesitation among agencies is like, do we hire up? Because these are grants, right? We don't know how long this will last. You know, there is a federal orphan well office that's been created. Uh, my money, I would bet on the fact that, uh, you know, as people retire, positions can be filled. But ensuring that you have enough people on staff to implement this, to, to put together the plugging packages, as they call, uh, is vitally important. Uh, but it's also important to look at that uh, pipeline of workers because this was always sort of a boutique industry, at least in Appalachia, uh, for a while. And I think if we want to take it to the next level, we're going to have to figure out how to invest funds into workforce development. Greg, do you have anything to add there? No, I think I will just add to that uh, the need for additional regulatory jobs is something that um, that is not considered in the report. I think uh, um, part of that is that uh, some of these are are, are are new efforts, right? At least in the EPA piece, so we really don't know uh, how that necessarily will impact. And of course, measuring uh, what that work will be like might be slightly different than other uh, efforts. Uh, I did not get a chance. I have a, a project in Texas where it was just one state, uh, but unfortunately, the Railroad Commission uh, was was not amenable to getting uh, related discussions uh, around that going. So, um, but uh, but definitely something to consider uh, that there are even more jobs uh, that will be needed to be created for this. Absolutely. And um, yeah, and I, I really appreciate Stephen's perspective because I think we lose track of the fact that we do need a robust agencies to be, you know, implementing these projects as efficiently as possible. So really, it actually helps the money go farther and be spent spent well, um, when we have um, robust funding for the agency. So appreciate that to, to start us off. Um, we had a question earlier, and I know you talked about, um, you know, apprenticeship programs a little bit, but there are some questions about kind of 
who can get these jobs? Are there ways to build in apprenticeships and make it more possible for folks who've maybe been left out of the workforce in the past um, to have an opportunity at this job, uh, these jobs? And so I know you all have recommendations in the report along those lines if you just want to put a finer point on any of those. Greg, do you want me to go again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah th those are really great questions. And I think, especially since these funds are going to mitigate, you know, a problem of the past of operators that did not uh, uh, plug and abandon or decommission their wells when they should have, and that a lot of consideration should be made uh, to the people in those communities to make sure they're involved in this process. You know, that's sort of a political leadership question of getting the contractors together, getting the agency together, and getting the workforce development people together in the same room and to iron out some of those things. And it, and I, I just want to emphasize again, you if you include things in the procurement process, when they send out a solicitation of bids, and those bids say that they have to use or utilize a workforce that's gone through some type of program, that will help incentivize that behavior that you're trying to get to if they have the leeway to do that. Uh, so I think that's, you know, a huge issue. And I think, you know, in vet, doing something like California, setting aside funding uh, and a grant program to allow that to happen, to bring contractors and unions, especially together, uh, because this is like this workforce in Appalachia who's plugging well is not traditionally a unionized workforce. You know, unions are mostly involved more in the midstream and downstream of natural gas and oil, not in the upstream and the gas services. So, uh, and this is something that's going to be around for a long time. So it's, I think that's a very important question and I'd be happy to help with anything that we can do on that end. Yeah, I, I would just add uh, that the purpose of this report is to provide some sense of like, well, how many jobs are we talking about? How much investment should you be making um, as a state and thinking about this process and setting up the uh, certifications and, and those types of things and requirements uh, to ensure that these jobs are, are really uh, providing benefit to the individuals in their in their communities. So definitely. Yeah. And we have some more questions in the chat talking about, you know, will folks, do we risk people leaving the region for these jobs in other areas, things like that, that I think we can talk to. And I think one in the chat that is really kind of related to the points y'all just made, and that was um, whether or not there are examples of unions doing this work. And I, that's particularly relevant because as many of us know, um, you know, unions um, can hold a lot of the training and the apprenticeships to kind of build up that pipeline of workers as long as there's clear communication with those unions that those those jobs are coming and that those careers, you know, will exist on, to, on into the future, then they become an incredible partner as far as building up, building up that workforce and, and inclusiveness. So I don't know if, you know, Ted or Greg, if you want to, you know, put a, put a finer point on that, on, on, on any of those things um just around and and the need and i know one thing ted has looked at is how because unions play such a large role and the ability to scale up workforce in the region um as well as make sure they're good jobs um are there ways that agencies can be presenting this work so that it's more accessible to those high road contractors that are investing in local workers yeah i mean i would just reiterate what in the conclusion of the report uh, in the procurement policies and things like that. And also I think it seems like what Pennsylvania, their Commonwealth Workforce Development Program, it seems like that could also help move the needle a little bit on that, depending on if that jump starts uh, some type of curriculum with like the operating engineers and the uh, laborers, you know, so on the work sites, uh, they have to submit, uh, you know, these uh, per certified payroll to the Department of Interior and to the DEPs, State Oil and Gas Regula Regulatory Commissions, whoever they are, Pennsylvania, it's the DEP and West Virginia, it's the DEP or ODNR in Ohio. You know, they have, you know, look at being able to look at that, you can tell that it's mostly the prevailing wages getting paid or under operating engineer laborers and Teamster, which is truck driver. So those are seem to be the three main fields of work or crafts along with the Teamsters into that work. So I think thinking that through can help us give a window into that. Thanks. Greg, anything to add there? 
I mean, just the importance and and, and value of, of union jobs, right? Uh, and the need for for worker representation uh, is is pretty critical here. And creating structured pathways uh, for this really is is very beneficial um, for for those individuals. I, I'll also say that you know I know that there have been some comments in the chats around uh, people being getting skilled and then leaving the region, right? Uh, and one of the things that we try to emphasize here in the report is that these are. These are jobs that are going to be ongoing for many years, right? Uh, in, in many cases, uh, and so there's there's not a, a need to like skill, do your work, and then leave. Uh, and they're also transferable to to things that can happen within the region. So that's a great point. Thank you. Um, there's a couple questions, um, kind of on the methane side of of the equation, um, um and uh, in particular. Um, some of the questions about kind of assessment of what's needed for the the wells. How do we make sure you know the certification that folks are doing this job properly? Um, and are there ways that um, we know about kind of triaging the the worst or most needed well plugging versus sites that might be smaller and less problematic? Is that is that part of the equation? So there's a kind of a couple questions um, lumped in together. Um, but yeah, some, and I think in general, you know, curiosity, like how are they finding the wells? How are they prioritizing the wells? And how are they making sure that those wells are um, solved, the problem is solved um, in the best way possible? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I think you have to monitor wells theoretically forever uh, because we don't know how long a plugging job lasts. And that's one of those things you're not allowed to talk about. I used to joke around about, you know, I had to say, my only last 20 years, 50 years, uh, cement, you know, cracks. Uh, so, and it doesn't last as long as you think it's going to last. Um, so lot, lots of questions there. I mean, I think on the methane stuff, there probably will be grants that states can, uh, give out through the MERP down the road, uh, that additional money we talked about that they would be able to give out to do met methane measurement to maybe help fund some seed projects. I know different states, the first 25 million that went to each state for the initial grants, I think they were just trying to get it out the door, get big contracts together and just plug as many wells as they could uh and i think you know they didn't pay as much attention i would argue as they could have to the ones that were leaking uh and i understand that too because if you have a couple that are leaking and you have a bunch around it you might as well plug all of them there instead of just you know if you just plug the ones that you know are leaking start out with those the costs are going to be very high because uh, you want to group those wells in a larger package to bring down costs but you know, it's with, you know, through the bill, even the orphan well bill, you're allowed to spend money on methane stuff and what states want to do and how they want to procure that. You know, I would meet with them and talk to them about that because that is a permissible use of the IIJ money. And I think it definitely will be with the you know, MERP money, but that remains to be seen. You know, everything from that 1.55 billion of MERP money has not been, we've just seen 350 million go out, you know, presented it, go out the door. I'm not exact. It's, it's hard to tell exactly where all that funds are going, but it's supposed to go to methane mitigation. So we'll wait and see on that. So we're a little bit kind of building the plane while flying it. We've got a huge amount of money injected into as you know, Ted said, a boutique or a, a really new industry. And so um, it's definitely a great time to be playing close close attention and thinking um, really concretely about what we want to see, how we want to have it developed, because I think we have a chance to shape this industry while it's kind of growing and being built. So even if there are aspects that are frustrating or not going well, it's um, such a good time to be making note of those so that we can, because like Ted and Greg are saying, this is going to be going on for 50 more years. And so we really are at the beginning of this and, and have an opportunity to really shape what we want it to look like and who, who we want it, the kind of um, values we want it to reflect. Um, I, you may have talked about this a little bit, but there's, you know, question about whether the money can go towards, um, you know, development of technology and detecting and monitoring, um, leaking methane, um, how, are, how are we finding these wells? Um, if there's any kind of um, extra information y'all wanna um, shine a light on, on that. Yeah, I mean, I would just say there's, I'm actually at a conference right now with the uh, petroleum engineers. There's all kinds of devices out there now. 
And, you know, one thing I wanted to highlight, I forgot to, is that in the formula grants, that's the 2 billion of the 4.7 billion in the IIJA. You know, it's a lot of acronyms and numbers there. Uh, so Pennsylvania, let's just use them as an example. They're going to pr predictably get around 300 million from that around there. Uh, and so in the guidance, they have to do a pre and post methane measurement. So there's going to be a huge need for those types of services. Uh, and how much states want to spend on leak detect, you know, finding these wells using drones and things like that, you know, that's really up to them. I mean, I would really be talking to your state regulators about how much, you know, that's a priority. I think initially the priority was like, we need to plug as many wells, see what we can do and get this uh, stuff ramped up. Uh, the priority was not on the on uh, the methane detection side but i think now that that has to be part of that unfortunately there's also a bill <laughs> at the uh, federal level uh with uh, uh unfortunately a lot of pennsylvania's delegation on it that would stop uh the department of interior basically from telling them they have to measure the methane <laughs> That's a whole nother discussion, but uh, that's getting in the way of uh, what was called the methane reduction infrastructure. <laughs> so how do you how do you reduce it if you don't know? Um, so I think that's a big issue. But I would you know just strongly recommend collaborating with the DP because they definitely could give out grants and use the money you know to explore pilot projects uh, on methane detection and things like that to make sure they're fine the, the higher emitters uh, among orphan wells. I think that might have addressed it. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I think I think that was really great, Greg. I don't know if you have anything to add from your perspective. Um, I, I mean, I would just say, you know, the the this opportunity to really see where these leaks are and where you can have the biggest benefit for for reducing uh, methane reduction is is like a key part of 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 you know what we're hoping for in the future. Uh, I don't think, unfortunately, that there's anything structured around like find your top emitters and get rid of them, right? Um, and the hope is that they'll just end up being covered uh, as we as we go through these processes. So, um, but with new technology, both at the satellite level, um, you know, uh, I, I know we've recently heard about Kazakhstan and their uh, tremendous uh, contribution to methane uh, leaks uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, this is something that can that that's pretty important. Also, I think what's really helpful about that is it provides social pressure. Um, on legislators uh, and local government to say like, well, what are you doing? Look at this emission. We can see it from space. Um, and this is the, the consequence for that. So so hopefully at least uh, there will be some benefit for that there. Great. So yeah, so, you know, these rules will be as impactful as always as the citizens who are pushing for them to be improved and to be better. So there's definitely a role for folks to really be shaping this, it sounds like. There's a question in the chat that I think is really interesting um, for Greg and, um, you know, because you've worked on this issue and, you know, in multiple states, um, you know, if you have any reflections um, on kind of kind of learnings or any plans to to bring your bring your research into other areas, um, just from your perspective, kind of looking at this um in all in all the different ways the states are approaching it too. So. Yeah, no, I, I um, you know, I've I've engaged this report uh, with Ted in the Appalachian region. I did a report in Texas. Um, I'm collaborating now on a report uh, in Louisiana, uh, focusing on um, sort of uh, their regulatory efforts. Uh, I I think that uh, the you know the challenges that we have here are. Um, are, are sort of how that state integrates this this effort, uh, and whether the state fully takes uh, advantage of 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 the of these this funding to sort of offset the cost and ensure that these workers are there. Um, and so there's definitely a need uh, both for more study uh, nationwide and also in particular states uh, to see see what opportunities there are for additional jobs. I'm I'd be fascinated to work um, in a region uh, where we know there's a high uh, high level of union involvement. Texas is not definitely known for that. Um, um, and so uh, this part of the part of the part of the great thing about working in the Appalachian region is there are some um, some strong unions that provide some sort of structure um, and uh, and potentially support uh, for for that that use. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I, I think it can't really be made clear enough how much, um, the states have a lot of control and how this is implemented. And so the programs are, you know, really looking 
um, different based on on how the states are approaching these puzzles. And again, it kind of points back to the fact that there's a lot of um, need and opening for, you know, people, regular people and um, to get involved in um, making sure that states, you know, know what the best practices are, that they're um, that they're approaching this in the most efficient and productive way. Um, I have gotten through all of the questions that I caught in the chat. Um, I, it's totally possible. I missed some, I had a little technical technology glitch near the beginning of the call. Um, so if I missed your, um, uh, question, please ask it again. Um, um and Andrew, I, I see you're having issues with copying links from the chat. So these will go out in an email. All the links will go out in an email later today to everyone who registered. So you should be, you should get those in your email. Um, if you don't, um, you can just reply to the email that you got uh, that allowed you to join this, and that will go to one of our staff and they can get you the links. So we're hopefully pretty easy to find, and we definitely want you to um, have access to these reports. So they're not a secret. So let us know what we need to do to get them to you. I'm sorry the chat is as being a, being problematic um i'm not seeing any more questions being asked in the chat i wonder if i could ask um um you know ted and greg if you just want to reflect you know um briefly here at the end of the call about um kind of kind of what you learned or you know the sort of one biggest takeaway that you know you're taking out of um pulling this uh report together or and maybe your hope for the growth of this program Short and simple, easy question to answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, Greg, do you want me to go? I mean, I mean, for me, I think the big recognition is that you know this. We are at the very beginning stage of what could be uh, people's whole careers involved in uh, plugging and abandonment or decommissioning oil and gas wells in the region. You know, it's sort of like making lemonade out of lemons. Obviously, all of these old wells that are not plugged, or many of them are very hazardous and leaking greenhouse gas emissions. We can bring back thousands of jobs over the next 50 years to these communities uh, for people to, to clean up this mess. So I think it's just an enormous opportunity, especially people who have been laid off uh, in other industries, especially the coal industry or the oil and gas industry. Uh, so to me, it's just I can't think of a better win win uh, than using, you know, union workers to curb greenhouse gas emissions in rurally distressed areas uh, and, you know, making that all come together. I just want people to see the massive opportunity where we're talking about, where we're just going to plug around 15,000 maybe with these two programs in these four states. And we're talking, there's 850,000, I mean, like that's just, we're just scratching the surface over the next 10 years. So I think this has a real opportunity uh, for the region as a whole. Yeah, and I would add to that just that emphasis on, you know, thinking through how you are going to contract with organizations to engage in this work um, and businesses and to ensure and encourage union participation. Uh, the the many reasons to do so. One of that is if you're engaged in a union, you're more likely to stay locally. Uh, and so this work is continuing and then you stay where you are and it contributes to the wider community, uh, your your improvement in income over time. Uh, so that would be very, very beneficial. But just a lot of, of jobs available here, right? Uh, and uh, a great opportunity for us to think strategically uh, about how to, to utilize new regulations and, and just the needs of reducing methane emissions in the region. Yeah, I just want to say too, I mean, unions have a lot of the infrastructure here in terms of the large training facilities and the apprenticeship programs uh, in the region. I think in Pennsylvania, more than half of them our union apprenticeship program. So that infrastructure is there. We don't need to reinvent a wheel and build a bunch of training facilities to plug. I mean, the infrastructure is there. It's about bringing everybody to the table, ensuring that these can be really good family supporting jobs. Absolutely. One of the things um, I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, you know, for over a decade, we've kind of seen the writing on the wall that we are looking at this big energy transition and then it's going to hit our region really hard. Um, as, as far as jobs and economy, as we're moving away from coal and it's just happening globally. And it's, you know, that's, that's the fact. And there was always this daydream that we could replace some of those coal jobs with remediation work. And for a long time, that wasn't the case because the remediation work just didn't pay. 
And the coal jobs paid well. And there was a big gap there. And we're finally at a point, I think, with these new investments that some of these remediation jobs are starting to be wage competitive with the coal jobs we had in the region. And to me, that's just an incredible, such an incredible place to be um, as a person who's been thinking about this, this puzzle for so long and so wonderful to have the opportunity to um, actually create good jobs, um, solving this, this huge, huge regional problem. So it's, it's a really, um, if folks are new to this work, I can't underscore enough about, you know, what an exciting moment we're in and how much we are, um, just building out a whole new industry that just simply didn't exist, um, a few years ago. And so it's, um, great to, we just going to keep having these conversations. Um, I know you. Uh, there's one question in the chat folks would probably like the answer to. Ted, I know you touched on this earlier, but if you could lift up one more time the unions that you feel like um, have the closest overlap with the type of work that is outlined in the report. Um, I believe that's mentioned in the report. Um, yeah, yeah. So we are in, we have been working very heavily with the operating engineers and the uh, laborers, and the building trades in the four states, uh, especially Kentucky, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And they're very interested in doing this work. And I think we can, this, I think in the coming year or two that we can hopefully, uh, you know, make a catalyst to make this happen. I think we're looking at some strategies on how to bring all of this together. And we're excited about that. So the answer is absolutely yes. They're very interested in the work. But as I said, this traditionally has never been union work. And it's been a very small industry, uh, you know, plugging oil and gas. Now it's going to be bigger and bigger. And I think they see the future in this and they understand that this can pay, you know, uh, really good wages and be a, a permanent source of employment for decades to come. So yes, and I'd be happy to, if you email me, I'm happy to get into more detail about that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, as I noted in the chat, there's a, there's a lot of acronyms in, in any world, not just the labor yeah. world. But if you're not new, not new to it, then all the letters can start to blur together, but they are spelled out in the report. And we are happy to, to have those, those conversations for folks who are interested in, in digging into this work. Um, yeah, I think, I think folks um, from the labor sector are really excited to get in um, in this growing industry, especially now that provisions um, like the prevailing wage, Davis Bacon, um, are making it so they would be able to join in and, and pay their workers the family's sustaining wage that, you know, a, a union um, is, is going to give. So, yeah. Um, any last thoughts as we close out? I really appreciate everyone joining us. I really appreciate our speakers. I apologize for the technical difficulties I had at the start of the call. That's very unusual for me. Um, but yeah, um, I don't see any last um, comments. So Ted, Greg, any anything else? Just thank you for this opportunity. This has been such a terrific report to work on. Uh, Ted, you're terrific to work with. Uh, you're you're so knowledgeable about the region. It's 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 been a pleasure. Really appreciate this. This has been great. Hello, Greg. <laughs> all right. Um. Great. I'm gonna let you all move on with your day, and um, look to your emails for for more information and and all those links that we talked about. This hour went by quickly. I appreciate y'all. Have a good one.